Greetings to everyone. My name is Georgina Fakukaki, and um, I'm currently pursuing a gap year in Puerto Rico, where I teach design thinking and public education. How does the virus mutate or alter from person to person? Um, RNA viruses, like this uh, virus we're talking about now, mutate all the time. Uh, they, uh, they tend to mutate more than other kinds of viruses, actually. So far, all of the mutations that have occurred are really, really minor. Uh, it's kind of one gene, one protein, very minor. But we, using uh, sophisticated uh, sequencing of the gene, can now track these mutations over time and from place to place. So uh, there are several, maybe many, many types of uh, this virus that have mutated, but they're not more infectious. They're not more dangerous. They're not less dangerous. So the mutations so far have been just something we can detect, but they're not of any consequence in terms of the threat of the virus. Everybody worries that the virus will have a major mutation and that the vaccine we develop may then not be effective. Uh, I would right. hope the virus has a major mutation and disappears off the face of the earth because it's no longer infectious. So far, we have no evidence of that whatsoever, uh, even though we've seen many, many infections and the virus replicates many, many times in any uh, given human being. But it's a great question. Hello, everyone. My name is Darren Andini. I am a senior at Rivermont Collegiate in Bettendorf, Iowa. Do certain weather patterns decrease the effectiveness or rapid transmission of the virus? Yeah, so that's a really important question and it's been extremely controversial. So some viruses like uh, influenza are seasonal. Uh, they uh, come during the colder months and they tend to wane or almost disappear during the warmer months. Uh, although this type of virus, the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, has some variation in how vigorous and how fat well it grows depending on humidity and temperature, that's not going to be a major factor. So we're having massive epidemics where it's quite warm and quite humid. Uh, and we're seeing uh, the spread in parts of the world where it's still pretty cool and uh, early spring or late winter. So these climatologic factors, although theoretically important, aren't going to make a big difference here. What happens in the summer, regardless of what the virus does, is we tend to socially distance because we're outside more. Uh, when it's cold and wintry or very, very rainy or whatever, we're congregated indoors. Uh, when the sun shines like it is today here, uh, as soon as I'm off this call, I'll be outside and automatically socially distancing. So that'll be a factor, but it's not because the virus um, cares that much whether it's warm or cold out. Hi, my name is Nina and I'm from Taiwan. Since a lot of people compare coronavirus with the Spanish flu in 1918, um, in what ways do this coronavirus and the Spanish flu uh, differentiate from each other and how are they similar to each other? And what are the lessons that we can learn from the Spanish flu to prevent us from getting more severe? Thank you for answering my question. Great. Well, thank you, Nina. That's a terrific uh, question. Uh, you know, first of all, I'll just notice that you call it the Spanish flu, which is what people often call it, even though it did not originate in Spain. Uh, and uh, historically, whenever there's an epidemic or something terrible, people want to blame it on another country. So uh, when syphilis came to Europe, um, every country called it somebody else's disease, the French disease, the Italian disease. So uh, the Spanish flu had really nothing specific to do with, with Spain, just for the record. Uh, it was a very lethal infection. We have not seen a strain or a type of influenza to rival that uh, since. Uh, and it, in fact, there's a lot of controversy about laboratories that are experimenting with that strain now that we've been able to um, actually isolate it. Um, and uh, we don't want it to get loose again because it's so lethal. Unlike the current uh, virus, uh, it uh, attacked mainly younger people. And the reason for that probably was that old folks like me, even though it was not recorded anywhere in the scientific record, had been exposed to a relatively similar uh, type of influenza when we were young. Uh, it wasn't as lethal or severe, but we had antibody. We had some immunity. So the old folks 
didn't have as nearly what uh, uh, the young people experienced. That the full-blooded young men and women were just dropping over, turning blue from this influenza due to horrible pneumonia. In addition, we didn't have antibiotics then. And sometimes people who have viral pneumonia, like with influenza, get a secondary infection with bacteria like staph you're probably familiar with, or pneumococcus or strep, and that killed a lot of people. So they would initially get better and then they would succumb to the bacteri bacterial infection. Uh, so, but that is influenza, it's a different kind of virus. Uh, and uh, coronavirus is different. So we wanna be careful not to uh, make virological uh, comparisons between the two because they're really different. What we can talk about is the impact on society and the economy, the fear, the panic, the blaming, uh, and the lessons we learned mainly from that uh, epidemic or pandemic about social distancing. That's where this idea of social distancing came from because it turned out uh, that places that imposed those restrictions uh, relatively early were spared the, <coughs> spared the full brunt of the influenza. In fact, there were towns that walled themselves off, basically. They didn't allow people in, they quarantined, uh, and they didn't have uh, nearly the impact of influenza that we have. Uh, so uh, I guess the main lessons are, uh, how does the world react when something clearly very lethal is going around? Uh, <coughs> and uh, what have we learned about uh, uh, social distancing control to try and uh, stem the spread. Remember that was also wartime uh, and a lot of the problems that occurred were due to the movement of troops uh, to Europe and, and so forth. So that was a complicating factor then. Hello everyone. My name is Bao Zhuo Fan, but you can also call me Betty. I'm from China. I'm currently studying German in Xiamen University as a sophomore. Due to the inaccuracy of the present way of testing, is there clinically a better way of testing COVID-19 and identify those patients, especially those without symptoms? That would be all. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Betty, and it's a great pleasure to speak to somebody from uh, China. I had the great pleasure of visiting five cities in China not too many years ago to give um, talks at uh, universities uh, there. Uh, in fact, I was in Wuhan, uh, which I understand is called the Furnace of China. It's extremely hot when I was there. It was about 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit as I climbed the steps of the Yellow Tower. Uh, and I've uh, been to China enough times to see how uh, Shanghai uh, went from having uh, uh, nothing uh, uh, except a field that, uh, where now it's Pudong. So uh, it's, it's great to have your question. So diagnostic testing is really going to be uh, critical here, especially uh, testing for uh, the virus itself, which is I think what you're asking about, but also for immunity or antibody to the virus. So um, let's talk first about testing for the virus. The main way this is done is through polymerase chain reaction type testing that actually detect the genetic material of the uh, virus, the RNA, the ribonucleic acid. Uh, and the uh, gold standard, the best test right now that we have is a nasopharyngeal swab that's to go up through your nose and down your throat and it's very uncomfortable. Uh, and um, uh, also produces a lot of aerosols of virus because people cough right in your face and you have to be properly protected with a face shield and a mask. Uh, so, but, but that's what gets, gets the most accurate results. It's the most sensitive test and that you don't have false negatives. That said, even that test has problems. That if, if the sample isn't taken correctly by the person taking it, uh, then your chance of finding the virus are diminished. If the person is either very early, very, very early, or very late in the infection, the concentration of virus in the nasopharynx is lower and the test may miss it. That's why you hear some people who are negative by test and then they turn positive. Well, are they reinfected? Probably not. They probably have low levels of virus that was just missed by the test uh, when it was done and now the test is picking it up. The easier you make this test for rapid use uh, by the healthcare people or for self-administration at home, the more you tend to sacrifice the sensitivity of that test as a screening test. When you have a screening test, you want to find out 
is somebody infectious or not, you don't want to have falsely negative tests. That's a disaster. Uh, and uh, we're already seeing that one of the very popular rapid tests may not be uh, as sensitive as we hoped it would be, that there are false negatives. Uh, and uh, we now have a home kit that you can take the test yourself, but it's not this nasopharyngeal awkward test. It's done through the mouth. And uh, I, I will see how sensitive that is. It, it's not going to be as good as the more formal tests that I mentioned. So there are trade-offs. Uh, but I can tell you one thing, if we don't get better testing uh, and approach what, let's say, South Korea has done, which is quite uh, amazing, um, at least in the United States, we're not going to get back to normal anytime soon. Hi, my name is Benal Dembry and I'm from Revere, Massachusetts. How accessible do you think COVID-19 vaccines will be to the general public? Yeah, how accessible will they be? Well, I've already talked about the problems of scaling up the production. Then the question is, how do you get them in people um, it, it, all over the world? And I, I got to make a little side comment here. Um, you know, equity and social justice are really, really important. Um, when I was on a uh, call with the NIH here in the United States, uh, I asked uh, what's going to happen in Africa. Are they going to get the vaccine? Are people living uh, in Sierra Leone going to get the vaccine? Are people in the United States uh, living in the inner city of Detroit going to get the vaccine? How are they going to get to the place where the vaccine's given? I mean, there are enormous global disparities and local disparities in access to care and who gets what. So that's the main point I, I want to make. Uh, it's going to be logistically difficult in an equitable system to get to everybody. It's going to be logistically very difficult to get everybody in an inequitable system. So depending on where you live and what your health system is like uh, and how much they consider social justice a priority, that'll depend on whether everybody who deserves the vaccine actually gets it. Hello, my name is Reese. I come from Chapel Hill, North Carolina in the United States. Mostly I was wondering if uh, a vaccine is the only viable solution to this problem, or if there are other methods that could bring us back to some level of normalcy. Thanks. Okay, well, there's the Tar Heel, I think, that's uh, asking that question. So thank you. Really good question. So it does uh, bring up the possibility of a prophylactic or preventative drug. Uh, I, I don't think the social distancing and all these kinds of things we're doing now are going to end it. Uh, so the question is, how can you protect people on mass. Well, uh, there was this, I think, false hope that uh, hydroxychloroquine, the malaria, malaria drug, uh, could be something that people could take. And it, it, it's not looking so great for hydroxychloroquine. And the other drug that we have in a pipeline called remdesivir is an intravenous drug that is for critically ill patients and isn't suitable for mass administration. So having a simple pill that people could take uh, when COVID sweeps through their community is, uh, would be great if we had it, uh, but we, we uh, actually don't have anything like that yet uh, in the uh, pipeline. So I think the best hope is actually a vaccine uh, for a general protection of the population.